So I guess we can start, right? Angelica, thank you. Our event manager, thank you for hosting us. And thank you everyone for joining. I'm Paolo Ciuccarelli. I'm director of the Center for Design at Northeastern University. I'm happy to inaugurate the spring uh, series of the Center for Design Conversations. As some of you may know, uh, this, the purpose of the conversation series is to create new bridge, to open new bridge, to trigger even the construction of new bridges between design and other disciplines. And today here we have a kind of a triangle or probably even a more sophisticated uh, configuration of disciplines. So we have information design, we have data visualization, we have journalism, media, we have epidemiology, health, and I think we have also an incredible prompt for the conversation that is the COVID-19 uh, collection that um, collection of visualizations that uh, Hugh Dabberly and Paul Kahn uh, initiated. So we touched very uh, different uh, relationships between design and other disciplines in the past, but I think that today we have a, a really an incredible opportunity to, to discuss what design can do, uh, you know, with um, especially with information design to help in such a complex situation that we are still living, you know, the pandemic and COVID-19. So uh, without further ado, um, Paul Kahn, moderator of this panel, this conversation, the floor is yours. And thank you for assembling such a, an incredible panel and, and of speakers. And I leave it to you to introduce all of that. Thank you again. Okay, hey, thank you very much. I can my screen to come up here. Uh, so um, thank you, Paulo. And I, I wanna thank everyone at the Center for Design for giving us this opportunity to uh, talk about our project. And uh, we've invited Marit Steffener to also talk about some of the work that he's done and Isabel Boutron, if, she, if she's able to join us, will talk about some of the work that she's done uh, aggregating uh, information on clinical trials for vaccines and other treatments. So uh, the subject that we're gonna start out with is a project called COVIC. COVIC is an acronym for the COVID-19 Online Visualization Collection. And we have a, a website for that at uh, covic-archive.org, which looks something like this. Uh, and on that website, <clears throat> we have information about uh, what's in the collection, uh, the intention of the collection for teaching and research, uh, some information specifically about the metadata structure that we've given to the visualizations <clears throat> and also a link to the visualizer and a tutorial for that, which I'm gonna demonstrate in a, in a few minutes. So just to give you some background here, we started creating this collection in March of 2020. Many of us discovered ourselves engulfed in a pandemic in March of 2020, and many people did some really amazing things at that point. What, <clears throat> what I started working on uh, was just initially collecting Co collecting uh, links in a spreadsheet that all pointed at this enormous number of visualizations that began to appear at that time. And that uh, became a little more formal as uh, I started collaborating with uh, students and uh, Hugh Dubberly joined me in this project. And we started out by, uh, for each of the articles, we had a title and a URL, we started being uh, systematic about recording the publisher and the language it was in and the country the publisher was operating in and publication date. All of this on the assumption that uh, at some point this would be of use. And uh, early in that project, I sent out a note to uh, collaborators and design, <laughs> design colleagues and former students just looking for any web page that contained uh, any kind of information visualization as long as the intent of that visualization was to explain some aspect of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we were right from the beginning trying to be as broad as possible in terms of uh, sources around the world, but also to include both qualitative and quantitative visualizations 
not limit this to data visualization per se. Uh, so there's certainly a tremendous amount of uh, quantitative visualization of the pandemic data, such as this example on the upper right. This is a, uh, a cartogram of the cantons of Switzerland showing the, the relative uh, number of cases in each canton or the uh, example below, which shows the uh, number of cases above the line and the number of deaths below the line. Uh, and this is from Le Monde. But we also were collecting a lot of qualitative visualizations that were generally designed to explain uh, complex scientific or social aspects of the pandemic. Uh, this one on the upper right is from El Pais in, in Madrid, which is explaining something about uh, ventilation in a room and how that impacts uh, having someone who's infected in the room. Or the example on the bottom, which is from uh, Bloomberg, which is a, a breakout here explaining the shipping process for the, for the Pfizer and biotech vaccine. As we built the collection, we created uh, a set of categories and subcategories with the expectation that people would like to look at, look at examples based on some of these categories. We tried to keep them as broad as possible because we're not trying to anticipate too much how people might use this in the future. So we have two medical categories, one about magnitude and the other about supplies such as masks and, and vaccines, and then <clears throat> three non-medical breakouts for economic, social, and environmental topics. Some information on historical risk covering other pandemics. And uh, there's quite a few examples for future models, different types of, uh, different types of visualizations for prediction and uh, a group on flattening the curve, as well as transmission and infection and some general biomedical research and advice within the data viz community about how to do things better. But from the beginning, I think we recognized that this was all about the figures. And while we collect uh, metadata at the article level, such as publisher and language and country and so forth, <clears throat> and so forth uh, we also, for each individual figure, assign metadata having to do with visualization type and visual technique and interaction technique. So what we're doing is we're actually collecting a page image for each one, and then we're cutting the individual figures out so that we can categorize what's going on in the figures. And we, we store these both as static images <coughs> and as uh, MP4s, if we've got an example like this one, which gives you an idea of both the, <clears throat> the mouse over and the filtering within the individual uh, visualization. So at this point, we've got about 3,200 articles and web pages, <clears throat> and they contain uh, about 11,000 figures. And in terms of sources, we've got a, a variety of sources, though certainly the most common source is the news media. And in terms of the uh, subject distribution, uh, we've got a distribution among all of those subjects that I showed you, but again, the most common one is medical magnitude and medical supplies. So I'm gonna switch over to the visualizer. So this is, uh, this is a, a program that uh, Hugh and a team at W Design helped to uh, Develop so that we could be able to make this all public. So this, this program is available to anyone to look at, and it permits us to um, filter and sort the material. So by default, we're looking at the most recent. These are actually articles from today or yesterday from the New York Times and the Washington Post. Or we can sort this from not from newest to oldest, but oldest to newest. So now we're looking at <clears throat> we're looking at images from articles in some cases from 2006 and 2007. Uh, this is actually the original flatten the curve diagram from a CDC report in 2007. We can uh, sort this by language. So if I wanted to see just the figures that are published in Chinese, we can. We can look at that, or we can uh, use some combination. So if I'm interested, say, in the subject of uh, economic,
economic uh, examples, but let's limit that to the UK. So we're looking at figures that are from an economic theme that were published in the UK. Now we see a range of uh, examples from The Economist, from the Financial Times, The Guardian, and, and a num number of other examples from that one country. And I think that gives you an opportunity to see what some of the choices of style and uh, and the way the way in which figures are represented, how that may differ from one country and one culture to another. One other example I wanted to give is the hello. We can look at uh, we can look at visualization types. No, I cannot explain why this is happening. <laughs> Back, thank you. Uh, and for example, we can we can look at cartograms, which is something that's being used quite often, because it's in the in the nature of uh, in the nature of this that we often have information by either states in the United States or Germany or. Uh, or departments in France. And so it's it's an interesting way of uh, showing that kind of material. We can also look at this by uh, searching for words. So I can search for vaccine and that will give me uh, figures from all of the articles that have uh, vaccine in the title. And I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna use this to uh, show what we can do when we actually look at individual articles. This is a, an article from the Times from April of uh, 2020. And this is about uh, speculating how long it's gonna take to make a vaccine at that point. So we can look at individual articles. We can also look at all the articles within that, I'm sorry, all the figures within that article. And we can look at the page itself. So we have a context of where those figures fit. And uh, we can also link to the article itself. In this case, the article in the Times is still available. And uh, just to give you a sense of uh, how we could find some of the work that uh, Moritz is gonna talk about, of course, we could limit this to a source type such as government. And one of the interesting things on article technique is we can look at articles where data update is a feature, that is articles where uh, the data on that in that page is always the current data. And if we uh, limit that to Germany, we'll see the government sites from Germany that uh, Great. <laughs> well, this is what happens when you do live. Maybe the vaccine uh, keyword <laughs> is still. Is the vaccine keyword the problem? Ah, Maybe? the vaccine keyword is still there. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. We do have some websites, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> it only does what you tell it to do. You're absolutely right. So here we have examples. Uh, from uh, German with data update. And this includes a lot of material from the Robert Koch Institute, as well as the material that Moritz is gonna be talking about. So I'm gonna switch over to one other uh, live example that I wanted to show you. Um, we had been really interested in not only showing uh, these individual uh, sorts and, and filters, but also trying to look at the collection as a whole. And we are working with, uh, Dario Ruggiero, who's a, a great data humanist, who's part of the Metal Lab at Harvard, uh, he had developed a system for looking at very large sets of images and creating a, creating a cloud based on visual similarity using some AI software. 
So he was kind enough to take our 10,000 images and turn it into a cloud. And within this, we can zoom in to uh, sets of images that are arranged based on uh, similarity. And we can take a look at a little bit more information about that particular one. If we, uh, if we choose to click on the title, that'll take us to the individual uh, example. And this has some interesting controls. We can change the size of that vignette or the number of vignettes. And this is a system that uh, Dario and his collaborators are still working on. And we're hoping to add this to the public website so people will have that as an opportunity. So I'd, I'd like to turn it over to my collaborator, Hugh Dubberly, and ask him to give us a little bit more background on why it makes sense to collect such a, a large group of visualizations in terms of how that can be used in design, education, and research. There you go, Hugh, you're on. Okay, uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, great demo. Uh, we had Paul's been very kind in uh, suggesting that uh, I had uh, much to do with this, but but really the the great credit for this goes to Paul Kahn. Uh, he did uh, virtually all the work and and uh, with some students uh, uh, collected uh, this amazing number of articles and. Uh, figures and tag them and develop the tagging system. Uh, some folks in my office uh, simply helped out with uh, uh, creating a, uh, some infrastructure uh, to transfer in the, da the database and to, uh, to make the, the visualizer. Uh, Paul, Paul mentioned that, that one of the things that he's already accomplished here is that not only do we have the collection uh, but we have uh, uh, already uh, a couple of ways of, of getting at and visualizing the collection. So there's uh, what we're calling the visualizer, which is basically a, a kind of standard uh, database uh, search and filtering uh, uh, affordance or set of affordances. Uh, and then Paul uh, has worked with Dario on this uh, this great uh, sort of overview so that we could see everything at once. Uh, and then we've also been doing some work with some students on, uh, on timelines as another way of viewing this. So we're hoping to have uh, sort of several different ways of viewing the software, uh, of, viewing the, of viewing the data. Uh, in, uh, in addition, uh, Paul hinted that, that we're making the code for this available. Uh, a, a thing that we had been hoping for was that uh, uh, the current state of software tools uh, uh, ought to be simple enough that designers should be able to do this on their own. Uh, we, we found that indeed setting up the database uh, is almost uh, something that, that can be done, I think, by, by most designers. But uh, building the, uh, the visualizer uh, really did require some programming still. Uh, but we're making that code available on GitHub uh, uh, so that uh, others could just, uh, should be able to just uh, make their own kind of, of database uh, if they would like it, and then make it uh, possible to visualize the data in the database. I mentioned that because I want to talk uh, briefly here about uh, uh, some of what's uh, behind our thinking in, in making this, and in particular, moving from from particular to general, and the idea of building collections to build knowledge uh, in design. Uh, so on one hand, uh, I think we, we might uh, generally agree that each design situation is, is particular. Uh, Harold Nelson talks in, uh, a great deal about this. Uh, uh, and then by that I mean, and I think Harold means that, that each design situation has a specific context stakeholders, goals, constraints, and so forth. And because of its particular nature, generalizing from any one design situation is difficult uh, because other design situations are, are likely to be uh, different, uh, maybe quite different. And 
we see this in practice because the answer to many questions is uh, certainly in design uh, is, uh, well, it depends. Uh, and what it depends on is the particular, on the particular context. On the other hand, knowledge, and I would say certainly scientific knowledge is general. It applies across a great range of individual contexts. That's what gives it predictive value. That is the value of the knowledge. So this split between particular and general has consequences uh, and design practice uh, remains quite specific. Uh, and I think in large part because of that, design has not really, uh, at least until very recently, developed much of a body of knowledge. And uh, I think also, therefore, there's, there's not really uh, much theory and not even really very many models. Uh, and if that's not enough, uh, the development of design uh, history uh, over the last, uh, I would say, uh, 30 to 50 years uh, has really taken a leaf from uh, art history. We have a kind of uh, design historians following a kind of art historical approach, focusing on individual artifacts and the heroes that made them. And this has been quite a wonderful development and it's great to see, but there is a kind of a, a cherry picking of very particular samples of already particular work and this ignores, I think, the, the broad population of working designers and the work that, that they all do. And so uh, a little metaphor might be that the Hope Diamond might be quite beautiful, but it doesn't really teach us much about geology. Uh, and so I think a path forward is to build collections, sets of particular artifacts, uh, but hopefully increasingly large sets of particular artifacts. So following the kind of huge paradigm shift of the information revolution, moving from kind of scarcity of data uh, to an abundance of data uh, so that we can find patterns uh, uh, in the particular. And from those patterns, we can begin to generalize and, and thus build theories and build models. Now, this is not a new idea. In fact, building collections is a traditional step to building knowledge and collecting is part of the certainly the origin of geology. Uh, you know, we we talk about, uh, for example, uh, the Cambrian period. Well, we call it the Cambrian period because the early collections uh, collected rocks uh, from Cambria, uh, and so there was a kind of uh, 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 almost citizen science approach uh, in the early days to building some of these collections, and the collections. Uh, really, if, if we look, range from everything from uh, anthropology uh, straight through to zoology. So a, a kind of a huge range of knowledge started with uh, collections. So I'm hoping in many ways that that's uh, uh, what uh, we could do here. Paul pointed out uh, that with COVID, we have a sort of unique opportunity uh, suddenly the entire world is focused on, on this event and people around the world are, are in many ways uh, experiencing uh, something similar. Uh, they have a, a view on the same event and we have this, this moment, uh, it feels like quite a long moment, but really a moment in time when, when everyone is looking at the same thing and making uh, representations, making uh, visualizations of the same thing and we can collect and compare those visualizations. And then uh, from that, uh, we're hoping to, that others will be able to use that data to, to actually uh, build knowledge and develop, and develop theories. So uh, I, wanna, I wanna wrap up uh, here, pardon me. I want to wrap up here by just simply saying that the uh, COVID-19 online visualization collection, COVID, uh, may be uh, an example of an emerging trend. It's certainly not unique. There are other broad collections of design artifacts that have been begun recently. Uh, so Louise Sondhaus uh, at Kell Arts has uh, been working on the People's Graphic Design Archive. Uh, and Annabelle Gould at University of Washington has has built a, uh, is building a very interesting collection of uh, assignments uh, 
that design uh, teachers uh, uh, create. And uh, th these are on uh, something of an open source uh, basis. And, and this gets to something that we might discuss later is sort of uh, how do you make a balance between being, being inclusive and also doing a certain amount of curating. Uh, so uh, anyway, I will stop there and say uh, thanks to Paul and uh, uh, to Paolo. Uh, and uh, I think I'm turning it over to uh, the next speaker. So yeah, well, let, yeah, let me let me uh, just introduce Isabel. Uh, since when we when we started in there, I wasn't uh, I wasn't really taking too much time to give you uh, information about who else was going to speak. Uh, I was really, uh, really, really pleased to learn that we'd be able to share this conversation with Isabelle Boutron, who's a professor of epidemiology and uh, uh, someone who's deeply involved in uh, the work, the scientific work of uh, spreading this knowledge and, and helping people who are doing this type of research related to vaccines and other, uh, other kinds of pharmaceutical interventions to, to try and control the pandemic. So I, I know I know only of Isabel's work on the uh, the website that aggregates all of this information, and I'm I'm hoping that we can all learn a bit more about what she does and how data visualization fits into the work. So Isabel, can you? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paul, for this introduction. Speaking? Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. You got it. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So as you know, I'm an epidemiologist and uh, uh, what happened at the very beginning of the pandemic is that um, it was a shock for everybody, of course, and we thought that uh, decision makers uh, whether it's funders to plan the future trials and the future uh, research to evaluate new treatment or vaccine, or decision maker will have to say whether we should be vaccinated or uh, take uh, uh, a given treatment, will need uh, information, and they will need information that is of high quality and is up to date. So from scratch, we decided to create a platform, and it's a uh, uh, so with uh, international colleagues, it's an international uh, initiative uh, with several uh, uh, Cochrane Center, the COVID NMA initiative. And so we decided to develop a platform where we would provide a living mapping of all the ongoing studies and a living evidence synthesis where we will synthesize the results of all these uh, studies. And the idea is that this would be made available online for everybody. Uh, updated uh, every week and uh, uh, people could just uh, use uh, the information. We were very fortunate at the beginning when we had uh, almost nothing uh, available is that the head of the CNRS, which is a big uh, institution uh, uh, in France, just did a call uh, uh, toward engineer and researcher who wanted to help us. And so we had all these uh, uh, researchers uh, and some were experts in data integrations, other were experts in data visualization, and they just came on, on board and helped us making sense of the data we were collecting. So here I'm going to present mainly uh, what we do on data visualization for research mapping. So um, this is the platform, this is how it looks like, so it's covid.nma.com. So for the research mapping, we are quite fortunate in the field of clinical research is that all researchers who want to do a clinical research have to register this clinical research on a clinical trial registry where the data are open to everybody. And there are several clinical trials registry in different countries. For example, in the US, it's clinicaltrial.gov. And all the data of this registry are gathered on the platform from the WHO. So we, every week we extract, we search for new study, extract and, 
uh, annotate uh, the data uh, related to this new study. We also search whether new studies, uh, all the study were updated and we adapt our data extraction accordingly. And then we use this data and we update the data visualization we have uh, every week. So this is uh, uh, the type of uh, data visualization we developed with some colleagues and I'm just going to go on the website if everything works well. Uh, so that's uh, the platform. This is how it looks like. So here I'm in the living mapping. Uh, so uh, on the living mapping, people can see first where the study are being conducted and uh, uh, what are the different interactions uh, between the different studies. So here it's all the trials that are being performed whether it's treatment for COVID-19 or preventive intervention like vaccine. So it's easy for someone who is interested to see only the study uh, done in the USA. They just click on USA. They can have a description of when the study were registered, what type of uh, intervention they evaluate. They can download the database uh, and they can know which treatments are being evaluated and uh, what is the status of the study, whether the study is currently recruiting patients, whether the study is planned but is not recruiting anything, or uh, whether the study is completed and whether the study is published. So they have all uh, uh, this information. When we set up the platform, we were contacted by the WHO because it, we were answering exactly their needs. And uh, uh, so they ask us to link uh, the WHO website to our platform so people could check the data and use the data. And so people can also, um, uh, you know, select some timing. So that's the registration of a time. If they're interested in the study registered in a specific period, they can identify them and, and, uh, and use them. They can also, and that's, for example, um, I'm just going to show the one. Seeing that I'm stuck. Uh, the one on vaccine. So the one on vaccine is particularly being used by people who are uh, planning randomized control trial for vaccine, because the main questions currently is we have data on vaccine, we have a lot of randomized control trials, but what are the next study we should be planning? And uh, what are the important research questions? So we have a process where there is a process to identify what people feel are important research questions. And then we are using our platform to see whether there are ongoing study, there are already studies that are planned to answer this, re this research question. And this is particularly important because you, if you have already study planned, well, there's no need to spend money to plan a new study. Uh, you can see this quite nicely here, where we, and that was a, a, a data visualization that was particularly useful to, to, uh, to show the main message. So here you have all the drug treatments, we're focusing only on the drug, uh, for the treatment of COVID-19. So here uh, you have over time, and here it's the number of trials that are planned. Okay, and you can go for each treatment to see in details. Well, the first thing that is completely uh, mad for us is that the treatment that we definitely know that is not working is the one where we had the highest number of study planned. And we can see exactly when it happened. So you can see here, you know, at the beginning you had some studies and suddenly when you had, exactly when you had the communications from some presidents that had the high visibility, the number of trials explode. And uh, these types of visualization really show the decision maker that they need to think of other way to, for exploring the available data to avoid uh, wasting research, because I think definitely all these studies are wasting research. And uh, on contrary, if you want to see this UMA, which is treatment which seems to have some effect, uh, the number of trials is much lower. And the, the three you know, treatments most explored, which has ivermectin, convalescent plasma, hydroxychloroquine, did not show at all uh, very convincing uh, results. 
And very early for hydroxychloroquine, we had the results. So that's uh, uh, the use of these data. We also work from with um, other teams that uh, recently, so that's very uh, recent, uh, uh, I don't know how to get rid of that, uh, recent data, visual, sorry, data visualization that we had, which is based on uh, Philomimi, uh, which was done with, with a team again uh, from the CNRS, Quentin Lobé and David Chavalaria. So they're just using the, the data we have on vaccine on the study register, and they use Philomenia to try to see how the research question evolved. And for us, that was quite interesting to see, well, some uh, the first vaccine to be explored were non-COVID vaccine because they were already available. But very quickly, we had uh, mRNA vaccine that uh, were uh, registered. So we can see the main family of the vaccine that are currently uh, uh, being used. We can see also that DNA-based vaccine was used at the beginning, but very quickly, uh, this research question stopped. And so uh, very quickly, researchers felt that it was not uh, a good way to go. And on contrary, we can see that some family, usually we stick to the family. You know, you're doing RNA-based vaccine and you provide only RNA-based vaccine. Well, here, researchers try to mix the two. And that's when you have started having heterologous vaccination where you use both an injection of RNA-based vaccine and an injection from a non-replicating uh, viral vector. And that's uh, here, we can exactly see when they started trying to test this hypothesis. Um, and, and currently we can start seeing a boost that are being available. And for example, that's also widely used by the researcher from the European project. Uh, they are questioning whether we should test a four dose of boost uh, in, uh, in COVID-19. And so immediately you look on the website and you can see that very, very few studies are currently being registered. And so that might be worth uh, exploring more. But this, uh, this uh, was quite interesting. What we represented also here is whether the study was published or not. So when it's white, it means the study were not published. And when it's uh, blue, it means the study are uh, already published. Well, what's interesting here is that, well, most of the new studies seems to be published, but the study that evaluated non-COVID vaccine, which were done very early, and so we should have the results in theory, are still unpublished. So we can even see here uh, whether there's some concern about access of the results of, uh, of some study considering the delay. Just to show some uh, a paper that we did very early at the beginning where we used uh, data visualization. I don't think they're on the website anymore. It was very much uh, at, the, at the very beginning where we tried to compare the different uh, reactivity of the different countries. So here you can see the different country. Here it's over time. So that's of course uh, early 20, uh, uh, 2020. And each uh, line is uh, one study being registered. So a new study being registered, so plan. When it's green, it means the study was uh, international, a multinational study. And so uh, the little spot in, in red is the first death. So we can see that, well, between the first death of COVID and the first study, uh, there was some delay, which could be considered reasonable in some country, which could be uh, considered uh, uh, questionable in other countries because the delay is, uh, is higher. But it gives an idea on the, the reactivity of the, of the different uh, country uh, related to research, how quickly they reacted to plan research to answer questions related to COVID-19. Here, we also uh, use data both from uh, trial registry, so research that is planned, but also uh, all the data that are uh, available um, on, uh, on the different uh, uh, websites related to the number of cases uh, in the world. And so you can see here, here it's all the studies that are being registered. In red, uh, it's the number of new cases over time. And in blue, it's the cumulative number of patients to be included in a trial. 
So for example, you plan a study, you say, well, I'm going to include 100 patients. So here we're just cumulating the number of patients that will be included in trial over time. And so uh, it, it helps to see that the strategy were quite different uh, between country. For example, in France, we did plan um, uh, a bit late compared to the peak because you can see the peak is here and a lot of the study were planned after the peak. But when you're doing a study, uh, I mean, when you start the study and start recruiting the patients at the stage of the peak of the pandemic, uh, it's too late. It's too late. Uh, you won't have enough patients in your study. And so you will, will be stuck after the peak. And so you, and that was really the case. We planned a huge number of studies they were able to include a few patients and then the peak was finished and no more patients to include the study. And in a way for clinical trialists, the fact that there were several waves saved some of the trials that were able to recruit as a second wave. And that was really, really the case. And so we can see that according to the, to the peak, well, at least in France, it was, it was probably a, a bit late. And the difference is also that we planned a lot of small study in the UK, the strategy was quite different. They did a limited number of study, but in the end, they included uh, the same number of patients and even more patients than in France because they favor doing very big study, very large study, which was uh, obviously the, the right uh, strategy. So again, this helps to understand how research reacted and what were the issue we had in, in doing this research. And that was, these data were uh, particularly important for us. Uh, the last um, data visualization I wanted to show you is that we also uh, provide data visualization where we present the treatment uh, to what the treatment was compared. Was it compared to no treatment or to an existing treatment? Uh, each dot is uh, um, a trial and it's bigger if it's a uh, high sample size. And the color is whether the study is currently being recruiting patients or whether the study is finished. So here, most studies were being recruiting, but we can immediately see what are the results. And here it's according to the severity of the disease. So here's a study done in mean patients in patients with were moderate to severe and here in severe patients. And so immediately with this data visualization, we can see what are the treatments uh, where some studies are missing. Uh, so for example, well, remdesivir, we had some studies for uh, mixed patients, but very few for severe patients. And so that could also help uh, uh, funders and researchers to decide which uh, uh, study they should plan. So uh, I would like just to finish by uh, acknowledging all the research team that worked a lot, both in the data integration, which was really important to make this data visualization possible, and uh, also worked on the data visualization. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Isabel. So I, I, I wanted to um, just provide a little segue here between uh, this remarkable work that Isabel is sharing with us, which is clearly directed towards the professional audience. And uh, move on to Moritz Stefaner, who not only is very good at debugging live demos, but is uh, also well known as uh, one of the leading data visualization designers in the world. And I thought it would be really wonderful if he could share with us the experience he had in working on a site that is not so much for uh, the health professional, but for the general population. So Maritz, why don't you tell us about the dashboard that you worked on? Wonderful, yeah, thanks for the introduction. It's really amazing to see uh, these projects come together and get this bird's eye view on the pandemic, like both from the communication side, but also the medical side, as we've seen. And now we go to frog's eye view on a very like specific particular project. And I'll, I'll share a bit of the motivation and process there. Um, just to get a sense of, yeah, this is the, one of the little data dots <laughs> in the big cloud of activities. So um, as Paul said, uh, we designed the official German COVID-19 vaccination dashboard. It's a team effort. So this is work together with Studio Land in Berlin and Cosmonauts and Kings um, for the yeah, German Federal Ministry of Health 
and the Robert Koch Institute, which is sort of the scientific uh, analytic arm of that is uh, of the ministry, right? And talking about dashboards, we have a lot in the COVID project as well. And I think we've all seen a lot of them with live updates and case counts and, and vaccination statistics. And thinking about how we how we do this project, we realize these dashboards are often real, built with off-the-shelf tools. And these originate mostly from a science or business analytics background, so are maybe more made for experts. And um, in the whole dashboard paradigm, this idea of effective communication to lay audiences or contextualizing the data or also aspects of accessibility are not really baked in, right? Because they're made as, as tools for people who know maybe already what the data means. And we found that um, a lot of the ad hoc infrastructure was built just by using these off-the-shelf tools, but that led to cluttered and slow and sometimes confusing experiences for people. So we tried to really follow a much more responsive and content and communication oriented approach by thinking about, okay, what do people need to know about the progress of the vaccination? And how can we make sure that we reach actually everybody in Germany with that information, right? And so, um, yeah, you can see if, if we succeeded, if you think it, it's an, a successful approach. So I'll give you first a, a brief overview and then walk you through some of the design decisions in detail. Um, so if you go to the landing page, you'll see, first of all, there's a few big numbers, like we tried to identify what are the key numbers people will want to see maybe every day and really just quickly check what's the vaccination rate, what's the current speed of vaccination. So you get that on top. And then you immediately see we have a big text and it's sort of funny because we were hired as the data visualization wizards, you know, and then we said, okay, we need to have really good data generated text. And a lot of the heavy lifting will be done through text. And I'll talk a bit more about the role of text on the site. Um, and so we wanted to make sure people have a really clear entrance here and not, are not directly overwhelmed with all the detail information. When you scroll down, you'll see a fairly unique feature. It's a vaccination clock sort of that tells you how many people are currently vaccinated per second. You know, if they were spread across the day equally, and that gives you like a gut feeling of the speed of the vaccination. Uh, then we have charts on the vaccination status, um, the uh, regional breakdown. You don't need to understand everything. This is just for impressions. You'll see a few of these charts again. Um, how is the local like differences, both absolute and relative numbers? Um, how do we break down by age groups? How has the speed of the vaccination progress been in the different? Uh, like the first, second, and booster vaccinations, the daily speed, the delivery. So the more we go down on the page, the more specific the information becomes. And we end with like a milestone section that presents the big sort of steps and achievements along the vaccination process. And that was important in the beginning because it, it was clear it's a long campaign, so we needed to have some in-between goals. So we were thinking a bit about the psychology of, of the information as well, for sure. Um, and at the end, you can download the data and get additional info and so on. So going into some of the details, so I think one of the first things that's maybe unique is this site was actually designed mobile first. So we were thinking about how does that work on the phone before even thinking about how does it work on the desktop. And the benefit of that is really you think much more about what's important, what's the best order of things, what's the information hierarchy. So you're forced to be selective. and. That helped with the whole design, and it was also a good idea from an audience point of view. We did, in fact, have twice as many mobile users than desktop users, right? So a lot of the live updates on the pandemic were done on mobile devices. Um, second thing I hinted at already, this, these huge texts and also the text often in combination with the charts um, played a big role. And we think it's just uh, an often overlooked and, and just so important part and especially the role of dynamic text, you can almost see that as a chart type. So we were thinking about, we have, we have a line chart, we have a bar chart, but we also have the text chart, right? And how does that play together with other types of information? And what's the benefit of introducing data generated text? And uh, in our view, it's, it's so versatile in a sense that it's low barrier, it's easy to interpret, it's screen reader friendly, it's easily shareable. So if you want to communicate individual facts and not big data patterns, a text can sometimes be more effective than a chart. But <laughs> uh, 
The, and this sort of plays together a bit also with the general direction we took here. Again, thinking about we want to reach everybody with this type of information, different levels of proficiency, different like speeds of information consumption. So uh, taking the same pieces of data, but then presenting different views on it has been a key um, uh, to designing the whole dashboard. So if we look, for instance, on these doses over time, um, it was one data table, like how many doses were administered over time, but we showed it in the clock, which is just a single speed number, basically. We showed it in that weekly chart that shows you the last seven days, like to see what, what the, the recent uh, past has been like. And then we have the full timeline, right? And you might say, well, why not just show one chart, right? But the point is all these charts achieve really different things and they also address really different cognitive and emotional needs, right? And so they're all justified uh, because they achieve different things. And that's a general thing about information design. You might think it's about taking the data and then thinking what's the best chart for the data and how does it work the best and look the best. But actually good information design is always concerned with how we collect the data, how we aggregate it, what we juxtapose. And so that's sort of this much more holistic view of how do we communicate data even. Um, and then the right chart to pick is maybe just one little aspect of the whole thing. Um, on the clock, so this is the slower version. You've seen the fast clock. This is the slower clock from a few weeks ago. Um, and this one was, I think, most um, maybe the most recognizable feature of the dashboard and also the most divisive one. Um, so some people got really attached to it. They said like, well, maybe I'm starting to get strange, but I like to watch the vaccination clock for a few minutes. Good news for in between. So it had this meditative and soothing character of, yeah, something's happening. You know, we are progressing, constantly progressing. That's sort of the thing the clock signals, obviously, right? And yeah, and other people suggested that oh, it's a propaganda and it's like, it makes slow vaccination numbers look fast and it's just a, a mind trick. And, you know, and so we, we got the full spectrum of responses on this one, uh, maybe similar to the New York Times needle uh, from a couple of years ago. These sort of metaphors, they sort of tend to trigger different responses depending on the audience. Um, yeah, but, but we were happy we introduced it because we know some people developed a different gut feeling, a different visceral like feeling of how fast are we at the moment and we're able to compare that across days better than by reading huge numbers, right? Um, I'm conscious of time, so just quickly. So we, we don't just happen on the website itself, but we also generate live previews of the, the key figures. And these are shown when you tweet about the site. So we use Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn basically as a display wall for our own information. Uh, it's been a uh, bit difficult to get that to work, but then it was very successful and very helpful. Uh, we even extend that to the little FAF icon. So that's always live updating when you go to the site. Um, and yeah, generally just really try to make sure we, we um, get good uh, translations in place, make everything accessible. So really think about how can we reach as many people as possible in as many ways as possible, right? And that's also this general idea that this is not just a website, but in principle, a platform. And, and we play a role being a node in a bigger information network. And we, we pass on our data and we provide our data in different forms um, through different channels. So I could later also talk a bit about process, but the hour is almost up, but I could come back to that if somebody's interested and so I'll just quickly end with, so the, the main points that I wanted to get across is so to us, it's much more about things way beyond nicely styled charts to design data, but really take uh, as a whole, like uh, on data flows and see what people actually need, which type of information then how to prepare it in, in the right way. And that really also means we need to think about system design and have this tight integration of designing code, especially in this fast moving environments where you cannot just do months of layout and then somebody produces the site, but everything was pretty much built on the fly. And um, yeah, this idea that thinking beyond ch individual charts is I think important because in the, in the end, it should be a, a wholesome information product. And uh, finally, just because somebody calls it a dashboard, it doesn't literally have to look like that. <laughs> in my mind. So 
uh, here's the URL so you can check it out yourself. And uh, depending on if we can go a time or not, I can sort of loop in a bit of process material if there's uh, interest for that. Okay, thank you, Moritz. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really fascinated myself by the, the, uh, the challenge that uh, you were facing, that Isabel was facing, and the team that, that she was working with, and, and so many others uh, in finding ways to visualize this massive amounts of data in a short amount of time for the audience that you think needs to be communicated to. So Isabel was pointing out several visualizations that demonstrated correlations that she felt were really important to the audience. Right? And I, I'll say that as a non-scientist, as you describe those, I could see what you were talking about. You could definitely see that you could see the difference of this and you could see the absence over here and the presence over there. Uh, so there's those types of decisions that are being made. And then, uh, you know, in, in your case, Moritz, you were, making making decisions about what would be the best way to get this message across to a to a broad audience uh i don't know if you could reflect reflect a little maybe starting with isabel about how did how did you get so many talented people to work together to create visualizations in a matter of weeks or a matter of months was there a, was there a model that you were following to to pull that together no, it was, well, I mean, we were very fortunate that in a way everybody was locked down, uh, nothing else to do. And so they were willing to, to help and they, every, all the scientists were very much willing to, to participate. I mean, it was, they were eager to participate and to spend a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning, we had lots of people uh, helping us. And then in the end, we had a few that stay for the long term because it's, it was not a sprint, it's, uh, it's a marathon. And so, uh, so it's much more difficult than we thought. Everybody thought at the beginning in six months, it would be finished, but uh, uh, that was not the case. Uh, I think we, uh, at the beginning, we had to learn to work together and so we had a phase where they were doing something um, uh, and that didn't fit at all the audience. And so we had to, uh, uh, to, to extend, exchange a lot uh, on the data visualization. I mean, we had a lot of fourth and, uh, and, uh, and they did much higher number of data visualization, visualization that is in the end on the website. Yeah, uh, because we had to test a lot of things and to make sure that uh, uh, the message was not uh, could not be misunderstood or was not misleading, and I think that's a big risk when we do that data visualization. Did you have similar kind of uh, feedback process, Moritz? Yeah, definitely, and I think this whole ad hoc like new groups or teams being formed ad hoc and just using whatever is available to quickly get something running. I think that, uh, as, as Isabel said, was, was in a way a refreshing way out of the, the misery. <laughs> uh, and, and I think is a very positive uh, like side effect of the whole thing that, yeah, it's like pretty random constellations were built, but then had to deliver something fast. And that's, that's the best way to be productive in a way. Um, the big question is now how to, uh, as we've seen, it all takes um, a bit longer now and how do we transform these, these quick constructs into something that lasts and um, works. So this transition is also tricky. Yeah. Um, and we had the same experience with the dashboard that our databases was constantly changing. Like what people want to see changes depending on where you are. The data that is collected is changing. The interpretation of the data is changing. Like the second vaccination is now not the, the full vaccination anymore. It's now we need the boosters. And so everything yeah. is, nothing is fixed. Everything's floating. <laughs> it's sort of an ongoing challenge for sure. Yeah, I think, I think that that's uh, sort of the, the, general, the, gen the general starting point that we're all describing. Um, uh, it, it may be true for, for the three or four of us, but I have a feeling it's true for thousands of people who've been involved in trying to put together positive projects during this time. Suddenly, your, 
your focus has completely changed and you you need to do something right so uh i'm glad i'm glad that you did what you did we we responded by trying to start collecting in the hope that uh, the collection itself would be useful in the future and i can see just from the couple of examples that we're looking at here that it would be it would be fascinating to see the types of uh, visualizations of correlation that are being used within the scientific community and compare that to some of this some of the same techniques or different techniques that are being used uh, communicating to other communities uh, so we have actually run a little over our time but if uh, and there's plenty of things for us to talk about but if uh, we have some questions that have been been collected I think we'd be happy to uh, sort of Bring in, bring in questions from the people who are watching here. So, Paulo, can you tell me where I would find some questions? Questions in the chat. Um, but I think what well, one was answered also in the chat. <laughs> That's interesting. The <laughs> question and answers. Uh, but Angelica, how much, uh, how longer we can? stay you know beyond the hour can we stay let's say 15 minutes and so we get some questions and we address some open points yeah we can definitely go to 115 um and there are no questions in the chat just yet there was the one that but that was answered right okay yeah Perfect. I, I do have a question if i may you know now that you you know you introduce you opened that door i i take i've, home, I've opened cool. the door go right ahead <laughs> So I think what is incredibly interesting in this uh, collecting these cases, especially, so I start with the COVID uh, archive, is some of the issues that you already experienced with the collection itself, so building the collection. So some of these articles, you said, you know, the, the New York Times article is available, but it won't probably be available, you know, for a long time. And at a certain point, there won't be any other way to access the page if not through those collections. It's a general problem with collecting, you know, archiving digital yeah. stuff. And so I that's personally is one of the other reasons why the Center for Design is trying to support this initiative because it's, you know, it's important to create it for create new knowledge for designers, for epidemiology, whatever, any disciplines I think can profit from that, but also because there is a tremendous need of those collections, especially on these kinds of artifacts. And so, yeah, what I, if you can talk a little bit about, about those problems and in, how do you see this in, in, if you see that as a kind of a, you know, lateral <laughs> objective well, of work. Yeah, I, yeah, I think as Hughes, Hughes uh, left the room at the moment, but uh, as he's pointed out, and I've discussed with him on a number of occasions, uh, having having these collections is, is uh, possibly a, a new way of thinking about design research. And uh, it's worth, I think it's worth pointing out that the process that we followed is, this is an opportunistic collection. So we're collecting the things that we find. And uh, as many of you may have experienced, but as someone who's trying to do this more or less every day, it is an infinite set so it's not as though you can uh feel like you're collecting everything you're collecting what what happens to pass you by or that you what you can follow when you read something and it leads to a study and then the study refers to something else uh, one of the really interesting challenges that i brought up is that we have hundreds and hundreds of pages that are data uh data that is being refreshed daily and then many of those pages, particularly in the major newspapers, have been redesigned as, as the data changes, right? So Maritz's, Maritz's site is not exactly the same as it was when it was first launched, as you would expect, and that's true for many others. So we're, you know, we're getting it always this snapshot. So when, when we collected it, that's, that's what we can see. But in terms of uh, availability, I guess, one problem is that things are ephemeral, right? So you know, the sites that we just saw are, are there. They may not be there forever. 
and uh, they may not even be there in six months. So uh, capturing these images, we hope, will be, uh, will be very useful. And then uh, trying to categorize the material, we're just hoping that uh, the, the metadata itself can be distributed. And then if you're doing a study, you know, if you have a particular issue that you want to work with, then you can start with that metadata and you can make it more specific to the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, but I, I want to make one point because when I've talked to a number of uh, collaborators and students on this, they sometimes misunderstand we're not collecting data, right? There, there are these amazing collections of data having to do with the pandemic. Uh, we're collecting the visualizations that are reflecting that. And I, I expect that there's a number of other organizations that are collecting the data, right? So Isabel, the data that you're working with, that, that's archived somewhere or in, in a number of different places. And the national organizations are, you know, they're keeping their data. So people who are gonna be interested in doing the research on the data will have that. But the visualizations, this is, this is something that we hope will be of interest as, as Paulo mentioned to people in public health, as well as data visualization, as well as computer science, the, um, communications as a, as a body of knowledge. Got a question in the chat. Yeah. If you want to address this? Couple now. Um, They're yeah. popping up you... questions. The first question is, could you share with us what are the technical tools you use to visualize? The technical tools to visualize, is that, I'm sorry, who is that a question? Yeah, yeah, that was the question. Yes, that's the question. But to, visual, to visualize what? Maybe it's for Moritz. Okay. Yeah, I, I can answer it for our part. <laughs> um, so we use D3, which is the standard data visualization library in, in JavaScript. And we use Svelte uh, as the application framework. So Svelte is a very nice environment to, to design these dynamic uh, and build these dynamic websites. And it allows us really to go from a very like coarse prototype to, to a finished design in the browser directly. So again, we do this very tight integration of, of code and design because designing data heavy products often involves looking at the data straight away and see what the data suggests in terms of shape and form and texture and precision and all the other interesting properties it can bring. Yeah. So I, I see a question here from uh, Irene Della Torre great designer uh, and, uh, and colleague. And, and she's asking, uh, uh, this is a good question. I'm gonna first direct this to uh, Isabel as, as well as to, to Moritz. Uh, there's a lot of novel types of visualizations like the New York Times spiral. And there's, there's a number of other things that people have come up with that are very inventive. And sometimes there's a big pushback on that. So. How do you choose when it's the moment to try some new type of visualization on this topic when it's directed to your audience? So the question is for a broad audience, but let me ask Isabel, when, when you're making a choice about which of these to use for your audience, how, how unconventional do you feel you can get and how do you make that kind of a judgment? So what was quite interesting at the beginning is that uh, they tried a lot of unconventional, you know, they're researchers, so they wanted unconventional. And actually the one that worked the best was the most simple one, uh, the most conventional, the, the map that was taken and uh, used uh, everywhere to, to, uh, uh, to uh, explore the data. Um, so it was more um, according to, to what we wanted to do, if we wanted really to communicate in a simple way, for example, the map was perfect for the WHO, uh, everybody could understand it and uh, everybody, uh, although probably they understood part of it, because I think they probably don't understand all the um, technique, all the things they can do with, uh, with, uh, with the map and all the filtering they can do, I don't think people uh, understand it. I think they use probably half of it, uh, even a quarter of it. Uh, mm -hmm. But that was the simplest one. And then when we wanted to explore a research question and do a research paper, that's when we moved to more uh, sophisticated uh, um, data visualization. 
Okay. What what kind of choices did you make, Moritz? Yeah, it's sort of an ongoing, of course, <laughs> thing to to consider when you design information uh, visualizations. And yeah, let me. Let, I'm gonna. I, I'm going to interrupt you for a moment because sure. those of you who are not familiar with Moritz's work, Moritz has created some of the most effective non-conventional visualizations <laughs> I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but that's yeah. my goal is to do something unique and, and effective and expressive, right? And yeah. But at the same time, I much more like acknowledge now that we are all very different people and we all bring very different things in terms of expectations and knowledge and capabilities you know to the table and so i'm now much more rather than trying to find one super clever way to show one data set to provide uh, a couple of different ways because ultimately again it's for some people the text might be the best way for others the super detailed network map for others um, uh, sonification or a little video clip you know so we, we're really different in that regard and so i'm thinking much more about doing the same thing in different ways you know the same ingredient in different preparations basically is often i think the the best way to address this and i think when you do a, a original or non-conventional visual i think it's it's always justified if it's if it's called for right so if you need to draw attention to something or if you need to for people to have something they can relate to on an emotional level or if it's needed that they remember it really well right these are all really functions also traditionally maybe deemed non-effective visual can have and then it becomes effective in its own sense but if you just do something original for the sake of being clever you know and you have like a really important public health message to get across then maybe it's not a good design choice um, yeah yeah, I, 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 I think myself that one of the really interesting questions that could uh, could be researched by looking at the, the collection that we've made is to, to revisit this question of what is the best way to communicate public health issues, right? Because the, the process that we've all been through for several years now is trying to figure out what we're supposed to be paying attention to. Uh, and there had, you know, there are playbooks that people had long before the, the COVID pandemic started. And it's not as though, I think as, as Hugh and I have discussed in some of our discussions, whether this is a new problem or simply an old problem that we haven't figured out how to solve. Uh, it's interesting to, to look at the kind of visual language that has developed and try to learn from that as to whether we're, uh, we're visualizing the the uh, the issues that really communicate to the audience that we're trying to communicate to. So I, I know one one of the interesting things that I've found is uh, finding visualizations in scientific articles that are then cited in the news media, and seeing how the same data is being represented in in the news media where you've got an art director and they've got a style that fits that particular publication and what does the scientific article look like and why you know what is different about it or, or why is it different i think that a lot can be learned from from looking at those types of things um we had one one more question i think we can wrap up with this one uh, how do you manage the fast pace of pandemic development, the technical investment that you think are needed, and the, at the same time, taking into consideration the uncertainty of all this? Do you feel a lot of resistance in developing these solutions? So I think I, either of you could respond to that. Hey, got to do this fast. We got to do it right. So what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't find my mic. Um, uh, for us, it was very, uh, it really on volunteers. So, um, so we had to, at least the technical part. And so we had to rely on, the, on the, their motivation to do it. And uh, so it was really important for us to find a, a way that it would be uh, interested in a scientific way for, uh, for the people doing it. Uh, now, I think um, when we try to discuss with the institution with the need to, because we need the same for other disease, we need the same for other research questions, not only COVID. 
and um, they're not at this stage they're not uh, open to that definitely not at least in France uh, the for the scientists well it's not research so we should invest in that it's uh, uh, it's communication so it's not it's it, if they find it difficult and um, for the so so yeah I, I think it's a missed opportunity uh, for them to uh, to be really useful and to really help uh, reducing at least waste in research. Yeah, and I think as, as, as Hugh was trying, I was pointing out in his slides, I think we, we do have to rethink what research is, you know, this idea that collecting is not research, that, that somehow you have to have a hypothesis and then it's worth, then it's worth doing it. Uh, we might want to rethink that. Morris, did you have anything? say on that yeah i mean just very similar experience in the sense that the, it, on the one hand fascinating to see how much we can do in you know ad hoc and in this really short amount of time but then the question how do we turn the sprint into a marathon and again maybe documenting all the lessons learned and all the the, the good things that happened out of it and all the case study aspects can in the end lead to something more sustainable or something that really transforms yeah. how we approach digital products you know in public health in the long run but it's still to be to be made and if we don't use the opportunity now it might just you know <laughs> app app down again and everybody's just happy that <laughs> things are halfway back to normal but yeah. i think there's a lot to be learned and so this this idea of collecting and documenting and also sharing these stories is, is i think exactly the right approach so let me just uh uh, wrap this up by saying that uh, I urge everybody to take a look at the, the site that Moritz put together and the site that Isabel is working on. I'm sure both of them would be happy to have any comments and feedback uh, that you might have to offer. And the, the COVIC site with the COVIC visualizer is available to everyone. We'd be very happy to have feedback. And uh, if anyone is interested in, in using that for their own research and want to give us some idea of what you're interested in, we'll be happy to start a dialogue and uh, hopefully get this out and get, get this out so more and more people can have a look at it. And of course, if anyone would like to volunteer and code and find images, we're also <laughs> we're also happy to work with uh, with volunteers. We don't they don't need to be researchers at CNRS to do this. I've got some I've got some students from the University of Paris that I was teaching this week who volunteered. So it's it's not it's not uh, rocket science, as we say. <laughs> so thank you. And I want to thank Paulo and the, the team at the yeah. Center for Design. Uh, uh, well, yeah, well, I, I will be even more audacious saying that such an endeavor, especially COVID, the collection we are building, it's you know, it's a lot of work. I mean, it's, it's clear, I think it's evident. And we are searching actually for partners to continue that collection. So I'm well, clearly we are not asking you for you for money, you know, but we are asking for support and maybe suggestions on how such, you know, maybe other universities or other um, organizations that might be interested in, 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 uh, in, in, in helping us creating that, that body of knowledge that is needed. So this is something that we are really working on uh, hard and Students are great with that, but uh, if you want to create something relevant, uh, that is a lot yet to be done. So thank you, everyone. And uh, I just wanted to tease uh, uh, a an, an next event we are co-organizing with one of our partners in, uh, in Boston here. So it's yet another panel around data visualization with two other panelists of a of interest, I think, for people working in the field, Georgia Lupi from Pentagram and uh, Natalie Mibach, uh, artist. That is, so we'll talk again about data visualization in the context of the Design Museum Boston conversations. And so that's another next step in our uh, construction of uh, thoughts and, and reflections around data visualization. So thank you for being with us. And next month, we will have another conversation of the Center for Design yet again, I think, around data. So if you sign up to the newsletter, you will get some just few news about what we do, updates on our activity. Thank you very much for being with us Great. way beyond the expected hour. And thank you, Paul, and all the speakers for, for that. Thank you very much.
Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.